Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. New York State, where budgets are months late, filling huge gaps with gimmicks and quick fixes. Where an irresponsible legislature and ineffective executives are distrusted and dismissed. Where the infrastructure is crumbling and where there is no coherent transportation strategy. Where fare hikes and service cuts by the MTA are the norm. This is New York State, 2010, the state of dysfunction. Welcome back, Lieutenant Governor Richard Ravitch. Mr. Ravitch has a distinguished history of public service. He rescued the Urban Development Corporation in the 1970s, is widely credited with saving the MTA as chairman from 1979 to 1983. He also chaired the 1987-88 Charter Revision Commission. He has also served as Major League Baseball's chief labor negotiator, and in July 2009, he was sworn in as lieutenant governor, the first ever to be appointed by a governor. And welcome back, Sarah Bartlett. Sarah is the director of the Urban Reporting Program at the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism, where we co-teach a course. And prior to that, she held the Bloomberg Chair at Baruch College, following a distinguished career as writer and editor on business and economic issues for Business Week, Fortune, and the New York Times. Along with hundreds of articles, she has written two books, Schools of Ground Zero and The Money Machine, How KKR Manufactured Power and profits. Welcome back, Lieutenant Governor. Welcome back, Sarah. Last week, we talked about Medicaid, which you, as you put it, has a great, uh, gravitational pull on New York uh, budget, a destructive gravitational pull. Today, I'd like, we'd like to talk about governance and infrastructure and, and higher education, what you've been working on as Lieutenant Governor. You've seen Albany from the inside, as they say, up close and personal. Describe sort of the state of governance in New York and what you as Lieutenant Governor and as a private citizen who's been looking at this for decades would advise the next governor or the people of the state of New York? Number one, I think that the way the government is characterized almost daily by the media is both unfair and inaccurate. I think most state governments suffer from functioning, in effect, in a cocoon. Most of them are located in other than the population centers of the states. They're inadequately covered by the press. And the picadillos and transgressions are of much more newsworthiness in the light of reporters, because it's, it's a lot easier intellectually to write about that kind of thing than it is to delve into the complicated issues of public policy. Uh, there is no connection between state government and the world of ideas, as there is in Washington, where there are think tanks on the right and the left. So it's, they're very insulated. And they're devoid of ideas? No, that's probably unfair. But, but you have to understand the legislature gets blamed for New York having a history of budget deficits. But in point of fact, all of the one-shots in the last 20 years, that, that is asset sales or borrowings, that were used to plug holes in the operating budgets, they were all initiated by the executive branch, not by the legislature. But it took the legislature to go along with it. It did. It did, but it's very difficult. If a governor says, I have a way of postponing pain, it's very difficult for a legislature to say, hey, we're willing to impose pain, whereas you say uh, it isn't necessary to do it. Um, now, <clears throat> do I wish that the legislature had stood up? Yes. Uh, but it was also part of the culture that dominated our whole society. We believed, as a matter of faith, that trees grow to the sky. Uh, 
that there was no problem we weren't smart enough to address successfully, that we had almost a genetic capacity to uh, overcome every obstacle and look at our history for 200 years. We have done that. And look what we did in the last 50 years when we overcame, a, uh, on the whole, not totally yet, a history of racism that was a disgrace for a society like ours. We've accomplished extraordinary things. So there was an optimism in, in American life. Uh, and people thought bad times were always temporary, uh, and the normalcy was good times, which was a rate of economic growth that would always bail you out of where you were. So when we had very good times, instead of uh, providing for reserves for bad times, the government reduced taxes. Uh, uh, which the public, uh, well, which wealthy people clamored for. Uh, and therefore, when we hit bad times, we had no reserves. And we had to resort to, to gimmickry. So it was a problem as much of our culture. There were very few people who raised hell about that uh, as citizens for all the reasons I described. Well, now they're fighting mad, right? I mean, now they want to throw the bums out and you've got the sort of the Tea Party well, phenomenon. And I mean, is that, does that give you grounds for optimism? It gives me grounds uh, for optimism to recognize that there's no point, uh, there's no political gain pretending anymore. Obviously, I don't think the Tea Party people have substantive answers to anything. Um, uh, David Stockman, renowned as Ronald Reagan's budget director, wrote a piece recently which he said both parties are equally responsible for dragging us to the fiscal bottom uh, as a nation. Uh, it's, it's a dramatic way of putting it, but there's a lot of truth in it. Uh, and it, we, we, as I've said, there's a whole new paradigm out there and people are going to have to deal with it. What's your estimate of how big the budget deficit for New York State will be next year? Uh, over $10 billion. How do you close that, or don't you close uh, That's a very good question. I think that uh, there are only a couple of ways of closing a budget of that kind. One is through cuts and the other is through taxes. They're no, no borrowing. They're no fairy godmothers. Well, one of the things you proposed was to borrow but to accept some responsibility, an independent uh, body that would force well, us I to proposed the it. Actually, what I proposed was exactly what we did in 1975 in the city when we created MAC. We said, hey, there's no way the city can get to balance budget right away. We had to give them four years, so let's create a borrowing mechanism in the interim for transitional purposes only. And that's what I suggested here. And the, the answer was no borrowing. What resulted, though? We had a, a budget that we was have, months and months late, and it, it looks like it's put look, together with bubble gum and well, whatever. What's worse is there's a lot of borrowing in the plan. They borrowing from the pension fund to make pension payments. They have a um, uh, a reduction in corporate tax credits, but when you read the fine, which they say uh, it reduces taxes for for corporations, but. If you read the fine print of the bill, they have to pay it back in three years. So that's where I come from alone. So there's borrowing in there, despite the fact they all said there was no borrowing. So we've got this ten billion dollar hole. How do you how do you fill it? How do you I just said, cross it? You don't. I, you have to. You have no choice. Uh, my guess is, well, I don't want to predict. I okay. mean, I hope that Governor Cuomo uh, is working on plans. He, you know, I had also recommended that our fiscal year be moved from March 31st mm -hmm. to June 30th because it's absolutely absurd to expect a newly elected governor to three weeks after he is sworn in or she is sworn in to uh, uh, submit a budget that he's had a lot of time to study and prepare. So, uh, but... What about, I hope there'll be a sensible plan. One of the things that has a tremendous impact, obviously, is the state of the economy. And we just saw recent numbers that showed that New York State residents lost, you know, there was a decline of 3.1 percent in personal income for the first time in 70 years. Now we've got Governor Christie threatening to 
kill the tunnel that was supposedly going to be one of the biggest economic development opportunities in this part of the, the region. Don't you worry that in addressing the fiscal problems, we're going to throw the economy even more into a tailspin? Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> simple answer. I have said uh, repeatedly in a hundred speeches in the course of the last year that our spending in, in, um, in K through 12 education and Medicaid is reflected in a decline in expenditures on higher education and on the public infrastructure. And if you think about it for a minute, if people say, hey, the most important and only way we can get out of this economic uh, decline is through economic growth, cutting higher education and infrastructure does not strike me as the right formula uh, to dig our way out of this and to start growing again. And this is a tragedy. I mean, this is... Uh, a serious tragedy, both what happens to the MTA, what happens to the roads and bridges upstate, uh, the Tappan Zee Bridge, the, uh, their enormous unmet needs. Christie was unwilling to, I gather from the newspapers, c uh, to consider imposing a gas tax uh, to raise the revenue so they can bond out the incremental cost of that project. Now, do I agree with him? No, uh, I don't. But I, I Is think it, it was an honestly, I think it was probably an honestly arrived at decision. Uh, but I don't know why we have the lowest gas prices of any place in the world. Uh, well, the MTA just voted to increase the unlimited fare to $104 mm -hmm. a month. Uh, as one of the ways, and, and yet they're keeping easy pass tolls the same. The congestion pricing, do you think that could go anywhere this time around? Well, as you know, I recommended that we tell the bridges it should, it should. Is there more, do you think there's a more receptive audience? I mean, you, you've been up in Albany, you know, recently. Yes. I think as this fiscal crisis worsens, the people who laughed at me when I proposed tolling the bridges are now taking it seriously. This sounds like Samuel Johnson regarding the prospect of a hanging. It tends to concentrate the mind wonderfully. Yeah. Is this, do, are we at the Samuel Johnson moment? Well, we're getting there very fast, <laughs> I'll tell you that. Talk about the MTA a little bit. The MTA is, looks like in its 2010-2014 uh, capital plan is $10 billion short. We, that's the, the MTA shortfall. That's not the state. That's $20 billion that we somehow have to pull together at the state level and the MTA. Where's this money coming from? Uh, that's a very good question. Mm -hmm. I, the, the answer is that it's either going to come from enhanced tax revenues, enhanced user charges, enhanced federal contributions, and probably a combination of reducing the scope of the new projects that the MTA was hoping to uh, bring about over the course of the next decade. Obama's just proposed a $50 billion infrastructure program. Psst, a good start, but nowhere near enough. I mean, if, if we need $10 billion in, in, in the MTA out of 50, this, is, this, this, this doesn't do it. It does not. How do you uh, feel New York's prospects are for getting some help from the feds? Well, I think that Again, what you see playing out in Washington is very similar to what plays out here. Uh, and that's why I made reference earlier to the fact that um, we're, we're caught in a total paralysis because the Democrats are being attacked for spending money that the federal government has to borrow to get its hands on. Uh, and therefore, this, particularly the Democrats who run in marginal districts, are very sensitive uh, to, to voting for more deficit spending. And yet, without deficit spending, we're going to have more and more unemployment in this country. So, I mean, uh, the bottom line is a lot of the problem confronting the state has, has less to do with government than the public, because the public doesn't want to raise the taxes to spend the money, but they want the services and programs that the money pays for. It's free lunch. So I think, you know, a lot of the blame has to go to the people. Nobody's telling the people it's your fault. That's right. Well, I wouldn't say their fault, but to say well, they, have very, responsible. They, they have very unpleasant choices to make, and they oughtn't 
to believe the candidates for political office who tell them there's a cost-free way of getting out of this mess. That's, that's what's so shocking uh, about you, the Tea Party. Um, when you look around the, the region, do you feel, and, and you compare that to what you know is going on in Europe and in, and in Asia, do you feel that we have the kind of regional transportation sort of vision for the future that we need? And if not, what's lacking? What do we, what should we be focusing on if we want to remain competitive? Um, we have to devote a lot more of the wealth of this country into public things than we have been willing to in the past. Um, but specifically in New York, what, what do we need in order to be sort of a viable... Well, we need a comprehensive plan as to how to allocate our infrastructure spending, and we need new revenue sources to support the borrowing necessary to make those capital investments. You know, it's, what people forget often is the fact that under our constitutional system, it's states that have the primary responsibility for the public infrastructure and in, within their borders. And about 80% of all infrastructure expenditures have historically been made by states, uh, and very little of it relatively by the federal government. But I don't hear so, a conversation within New York State about high-speed rail, for example, that that should be a top priority. I mean, we, I sort of feel like there's an incremental wheel. We need to fix this terminal at JFK. Or, is there somebody, anybody who's sort of looking at this and saying, well, yeah, we there are, are going to... Regional Plan Association has, has had a lot of very wise things to say about this, and there are people at the State Department of Transportation who are eloquent on this subject. There's a lot of knowledge around it. It's, it's a That's political not the question. Yeah. You know? um, but they're being ignored. And or that knowledge is, is because is, they are saying, in effect, to the people who are running for office, you got to tax more or cut more, and they don't want to hear that. And that's not what their constituents are, are electing them to do. So it all comes back to where we started. What is the level of public understanding of the severity of this problem, and who's responsible for this very inadequate level of understanding? Okay, I can't, who's responsible? Well, the media to a large degree. It there ceases easy. to serve a, uh, the educational role that it does in other societies. The collapse of the print media, the preoccupation with uh, sex, frolic, crime, uh, much more newsworthy than Well, let me, let me like throw budgets. it back. I mean, as, as a member of the media and someone who, who's teaching students to be in the media, uh, what we get back is, uh, well, when the serious stories run, nobody reads them. You know, all the focus groups show that you don't spend more than 10 seconds with something that's actually substantial. And they all go for, the public goes. If you look at the clicks online, it's all for the, the sex and the celebrities. And, and you know, that we, we know that the industry is hurting from revenues. So as a business proposition, can you put out a publication that actually focuses on serious ideas? You know, I... Um you may need a nonprofit uh, media. Well, we certainly, the United States has less of that than any society in the Western world, frankly, uh, and certainly less than a dictatorship like China. But the, the, we need a lot more of that. We spend less money per capita on public and nonprofit news broadcasting. We, we have politicized the transmission of news in this country. And on the blogs and even on uh, network television between uh, Fox News on the one hand and MSNBC on the other. Uh, how is somebody going to know what the truth is? Last week we talked about Medicaid, one of the so-called uncontrollable expenses for local and state governments. Another one of these is pension reform. And pensions are and have been a, a central topic of conversation over the last several months. And in fact, uh, Deputy Mayor Wolfson said that the city's top priority in Albany, top of its legislative agenda, would be pension reform. Talk about the role of pensions in the current fiscal situation and what ought to Very be done. Serious. Well, the city of New York uh, has a particular problem since they are required to appropriate the money out of their expense budget every year to keep that pension whole. Um, New York State had the best funded pension uh, in the country, or one of the very best. But this year they started a practice 
which to me is scary. They are, they call it pension smoothing, but in effect, uh, they are borrowing from the pension fund in order to make the payments that they are statutorily obligated to, to make. To the pension fund. I to mean, the there's, pension there's, fund. there's a real twilight zone uh, quality to this. It is, and um, that's a very bad sign. Who's saying no? They started, they started that in uh, Jersey under Christy Todd Whitman. Uh, they made assumptions about rates of return that were absolutely insane. Uh, and now the, <clears throat> I'm told the Jersey pension fund is less than 50% funded, mm -hmm. which means that sometime in the next decade, they're going to have to pay pension benefits out of current appropriations. Now, uh, if you were the philosopher king, what might you do with the pension situation? Well, I, I would first of all examine I would make sure that any new employee <coughs> uh, was not entitled to the same level of benefits that people get today. With the so-called, uh, what, tier five? Tier five. Well, I think you've got to examine additional tiers as well. Okay. Number two, uh, you have to examine very carefully as to, to what extent, and it varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, whether you can reconstitute existing benefits in a fashion makes more sense. Um, oh, politically. Isn't that, isn't that contractually set? Well, yes, but again, so are all the debt obligations, and so are all of the, a lot of contracts to build the Second Avenue subway that, but if there ain't cash, uh, something's got to give. And I think. As I've said before, the problem isn't one of these things independently of all the other things. So everybody's going to have to put, to use the vernacular, some skin in the game to solve this problem because you cannot take it out on the backs of public employees entirely. Um, <clears throat> What's next for Richard Ravitch? You stepped down as lieutenant governor on December 31st. Uh, are you finished fixing, Mr. Fix-It? Well, uh, probably. I'm going to spend some time with my family. I'm probably going to write a book. I'm probably going to do a little teaching. And uh, I can't keep my mouth shut, so I'll probably end up uh, commenting okay, uh, on the passing scene. Okay, talk about uh, higher education. What, what, what is state policy? What are the deficiencies in state policy? And what ought to be state policy? Well, uh, you know, I, I, people don't understand that in the United States there are three kids in public universities for every one kid in a private university. Uh, and it's public universities around the country that are being hurt significantly uh, by these, the fiscal crisis that besets all states. Look, California, the great state, greatest state university system in the country, it's been decimated. Uh, New York has more applications this year because of the economy, no doubt, than they've ever had before. And they're being cut once again uh, in the state budget. Uh, and the amount of dollars is, is um, you know, that's not what breaks the bank. Uh, it's just that the constituencies that care about that aren't as powerful as some of the constituencies we talked about earlier in this program. Have you ever looked at the structure of the SUNY and the CUNY systems and, and wondered whether there's ways to rationalize that yes. to, to get more out of it? And are there some concrete suggestions? That uh, you know, it's... it's um, I think it's something that the next governor's got to look at very, very carefully. Uh, Does that mean I really shrinking? do. Uh, Wouldn't that sort of fight what you just said about how important it is? Well, I don't think necessarily shrinking uh, is the answer, but I think that there, there are a lot of things that can be examined, including the right to set their own tuition rates. Mm -hmm. They're not going to commit suicide. The legislature refused to do that this year. It was a something the governor pressed very hard. It made a lot of sense to me. Bad, bad legislative decision. One of the reasons that you have this, almost this calcification of the state system is that each of the individual units 
are where they are for political reasons, and any changes on where they are will, will develop a firestorm. My, my mother-in-law lives in upstate New York and was surrounded by the State University yeah, of Dallas, Cobleskill, Oneonta. You, you touch any of those systems, and you've got, you know, political well, fire. Unfortunately, those are often the only uh, growing economic activities yes, in the upstate. I mean, upstate's a wasteland. Uh, you got a Buffalo, and the State University in Buffalo is uh, critical to the economy there. Do you see, as the election uh, plays out, a real upstate downstate divide? I mean, we hear about that a lot. Do you do you feel like that's been, you know, accentuated in the last uh, year? You know, or two? I, it's very interesting to me that w what you find is that the elected officials from the central cities have uh, one orientation. The elected representatives of the suburban areas are far more conscious today and sensitive to the level of tax issue than... Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's no surprise that the Democrats had difficulty putting 32 votes together for anything in the Senate. Uh, was not because the leadership didn't try, it was because there were contrary interests. And you see the same thing happening in Washington in a funny sense. Uh, so by definition, when the Democrats control a, um, a legislative body, they, they had to have done that by electing people from suburban areas mm -hmm. whose economic and social interests are different from the people who represent the poorest parts of our cities. So there we are, different di different interests, different politics, makes the game fun. Once again, my special thanks to Lieutenant Governor Richard Ravitch and Professor Sarah Bartlett for being on the show. And this concludes the second part of a two-part conversation. See you next week. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email. Whatever it is, thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it. Send it. <laughs>